Al Folan is the election analyst and statistician behind the highly popular uh, Twitter account and blog, Stats for Lefties, also a columnist uh, for Navarra Media. We're going to be talking today about the upcoming local elections and the prospects the Greens um, have in those elections, where they could win seats and much, much more besides. Before we delve into any of that, uh, firstly, Al, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me on. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on coffee number three. I'm still waking up, uh, but I am getting there and hopefully everything will go smoothly as it has done so far. So let's delve straight into it then. What's your assessment of the state of play for the political parties going into the 2023 local elections? Well, um, at the moment, the Labour Party leads in the polls by uh, 18 to 19 percentage points. And all of Hist the history of the last like 30 years of local elections suggests that will lead to massive gains. In the last 30 years, um, there have been five times when the opposition has led by you know, big double digit margins going into local elections. And if you average these out, they point to a gains of about like a thousand council seats in the local elections for Labour and equivalent losses for the Tory party. Um, but I think there are reasons to think that Labour won't reap such massive rewards, um, even if the polls don't change. Firstly, Starmer has underperformed in local elections thus far. He did in 2021 and in 2022. In 2022 in England, he only gained 20 seats or 22 seats, which is vastly less than the Greens and Lib Dems gained. The second reason is Labour's electoral coalition draws very extensively on people who voted Lib Dem last time around. And those people are very likely to vote Lib Dem in local elections when they come around, even if they do vote Labour in the general election. And the Lib Dems on top of that do much better in local elections anyway. You'll often see uh, the Lib Dems will poll like uh, eight, nine percent in voting intention polls around local elections. And then they'll do that projected national share of the vote, like how would the whole country have voted if they all voted? And the Lib Dems will be on like 14, 15 percent. And that basically reflects the fact that the Lib Dems are much better at mobilizing their vote in local elections and people just vote differently. And the final thing is Labour kind of suffers organizationally. It's not just that its active membership is lower than it was last time round, but in many parts of the country, it lacks an organizational presence. I mean, we're going to talk about Mid Suffolk later. Um, on paper, Labour is in a good position to take both parliamentary seats in Mid Suffolk, um, but it's only running eight set candidates for the 28 council seats. And in most of the wards, they're not standing at all. And that doesn't speak to a party that's very well organized or has enough of a presence to benefit from a labor surge even if it does happen so before we delve into the greens i'm going to ask you about the lib dems because you mentioned them there um so what do you think of the prospects the lib dems making big gains in these elections well they have done uh they did make very good gains last time and i think that reflected the fact they were having a bit of a, a very good time because they were on a on a, an upswing they've had by-election gains from the tories they've i think they've had three at this point uh in tory safe seats uh they have dipped a little in the polls since then although they're averaging about 10 percent now they're about 12 percent 11 percent last time um but as i say they always do very well in local elections and one thing that has to be borne in mind is the tories are going to do very badly and the lib dems are very good at sweeping up when the Tories do very badly, especially in local elections. And um, that, I mean, that applies in general elections too. There's going to be a lot of seats where the Tories are going to collapse in 2025 and the Lib Dems are just going to be sitting there waiting like, yes. For most of our viewers, it's the Greens prospects in these elections that are most interesting. So the Green Party's co-leaders, Carla Denyer and Adrian Ramsey have talked about the uh, Greens gaining over 100 seats in this year's elections. The Greens are standing a record number of candidates this time. They're standing in 41% of the available seats, which is 10 percentage points more than they did in 2019, the last time these seats were up for election. How realistic do you think it is that the Greens will win more, gain more than 100 seats this time around? I think that's very realistic. I, I, when I saw that figure, I remember my first reaction was, I think they're underselling it. 
Um, if you think about it, that would represent an increase of about 40% in seats compared to the last, uh, to May 2019, um, which would be surprisingly low given the results the past three years. Bear in mind, 2022, 119% increase. 2021, 140% increase. 2019, 273% increase. So a 40% increase, historically, that would be exceptional, but um, it, it would still be a slight cooling of the green surge, as it was, like slowing down. Um, for context, if we saw gains that were like basically equivalent to last year's, we'd be looking at 400 green gains, not 100. But I would imagine that's why they settled on that figure, because they know that Labour's surging the polls, they're likely to do far better than they did the last two years, even if they underperform. And, uh, you know, 100 is still, it's it's impressive and it's relatively realistic. So it's, I think it's good expectation management. Uh, I would be surprised if it was less than that. Um, but also if it was that, 100, still pretty impressive. In raw numbers, it's still met more than the last two years, just because there's more seats up. I guess the the other thing about this, this year's elections that we haven't touched on yet is that, uh, for the Greens at least, is that, because the Greens won so many seats in 2019, this year they are defending more seats than they've ever done before by quite some margin, because over 200 seats that they currently hold are up for re-election this year. Previously, they've only had to defend, you know, a couple of dozen. Do you think that has the potential to impact on how many gains the Greens can make? Because not only are they trying to make new inroads, but they're also having to hold the seats they've done before. I would have said that a few years ago, but basically the thing that the last two set of sets of local elections have proven is that the Greens success in May 2019 was not one off. If the Green Party had on the back of, you know, anti Brexit protests, which is a lot of a reason for a lot of surges in 2019, um, if they had surged to success and then gone back to totally normal in 2021 and 2022, then I'd say, yeah, you could be very worried about, you know, losing a bunch of seats, even if you gain a few, uh, causing the overall net figure to be to be low. But I think if you look at many of these places and many of the other places the Greens have gained in the last few years, they've basically solidified those gains and they've dug in and they've organized and they've kept that support uh, at or above what it was um last time round so uh, uh, you know the green party if you look at polls it's not a party necessarily at the moment surging to massive like poll numbers but it's not going down all that badly it was probably about five percent in may 2019 it's probably about five percent now i would be quite surprised to see them lose uh big numbers of seats especially because this is a set of local elections where the big story is going to be how many seats the tories lose and a lot of these places are places where if the Greens were going to go backwards, they would be going backwards in favour of the Tories. But Tories aren't going to be gaining anything this time around. So those people, I think, are going to stay green. And so let's talk about some of those places then. So where do you think are the councils where the Greens could make big gains this year? Um, well, it depends whether you mean like good results or big gains, because uh, Norwich and Brighton, We'll obviously see very good results for Greens in terms of share of seats, but not as many gains because Norwich only has a third of seats up for election and Brighton already has a lot of Green councillors. Even if they win a majority, the numerical number of gains is going to be huge. Um, but in terms of big gains, I would say uh, Lancaster, sorry, <laughs> Lancaster, Lewis, Forest of Dean and Solihull. And in all these places, the Greens have performed quite well in the popular vote and have been slowly building their support, but they kind of lag behind in terms of seats. Forrester Dean, I think they won the popular vote in May 2019, but they're still second. Um, however, with the collapse of the Conservatives, which I don't think anyone seriously disputes that there will be a big Conservative collapse. I know I'm relying on that in my analysis, but while I, I wonder if Labour will benefit, I don't think anyone seriously contests it's going to be a big collapse in the Tory vote. So Tory collapse and some defections in Lancaster where a lot of um, Labour councillors became eco-socialists and then moved to the Greens. Uh, they have a golden opportunity to surge in all of those places uh, in a way that 
is more than just building on existing support. Like I think there'll be quite an increase that's notable. Interesting you mentioned Lan Lancaster because tomorrow I've got a piece coming out on Bright Green specifically looking at the Lancaster elections and they're talking about ending up on 20 or more seats. Um, yes, yeah. I would be very surprised if they win a majority because the problem that they have in Lancaster, as I'm sure you'll, you'll observe, is that there's a lot of independents uh, and they'll take up a lot of seats that could otherwise be useful in winning a majority. But I, I would be surprised if they're not the largest part here. Yeah, so the, for, for viewers, the Lancaster Council covers a much wider area than just Lancaster. And outside of the city of Lancaster, you get a lot of independents. I think Morecambe uh, is, is the area where there's a lot of independents. But, oh, yeah, Morecambe um, Bay independents. Exactly, yeah. But interestingly, the Greens are the only party, I think, to be running a full slate in Lancaster, so running every seat. And uh, the Labour Party there are in disarray um, after the string of the factions and a whole bunch of other issues. Um, but some of the areas that I, I had on my kind of list of areas that there might be big green gains were Herefordshire and East Hertfordshire. I don't know whether you've looked into the detail of those and whether you have any commentary on whether the Greens could make big gains there. No, that... that, that, that um... Those two also sound about right. I mean, there's a lot of councils up for election, uh, a lot of rural areas that might be uh, in the film industry. We call them sleeper hits like you wouldn't. They're not really on the radar and then they'll sort of come out of nowhere and surprise you. Uh, and I, I, those those two definitely sound to me like they would be sleeper hits for the Green Party. Um, I do find it interesting. And we'll talk about Mid-Suffolk later that a lot of the places that uh, the Green Party has been doing well in especially since May 2019, have been these sort of rural Tory areas where their appeal is less, um, is, is different to what it is in cities like Brighton, Bristol and, and Norwich. Yeah, I think that's an interesting dynamic because I guess in Brighton, Bristol, Norwich and the metropolitan areas, it's often we're the more left-wing party than Labour. If you're disenfranchised by Labour, vote for us. In the Tory areas, it's often we're the only non-Tory who can win. <laughs> <laughs> and in a lot of places in these areas, it literally is only a green or a Tory on the ballot paper. And that um, that's had a big impact. So you've talked a little bit. You mentioned Mid-Suffolk a few times. So let's look at Mid-Suffolk. Talk us through the situation there. Well, the Greens have been growing in Mid-Suffolk for the last few set of elections. And in 2019, they burst through to win like 30 percent of the popular vote. Very impressive emerges the largest party uh, opposition party on the council. They have 12 seats, the Lib Dems have five, Labour have none. Uh, and then the Tories don't have a majority, but they were only one seat short, so they managed to stay in office, I think, with an independent support. And the Greens now only need to gain six of the 16 Conservative seats to win a majority, which would be the first majority of the Green Party on any council ever. They didn't even get it in Brighton, even in 2011, when they finally when they won minority control. In normal years, I would have said six or 16, a bit of a hefty challenge. Um, but in a year when they're collapsing in support across the country, I, not so much. I think it's doable. Yeah, you mentioned there that it would be the first Green majority council anywhere in the country, which is obviously hugely historically significant. Are there other places that you think there's the prospect of the Greens gaining control, either in a minority or a majority administration? Uh, well, Brighton and Hove is obviously second on the list because they're already in minority control and they have a chance to go up, take seats, win majority. A little bit harder than Mid-Suffolk, which is a strange thing to say, would have been a very strange thing to say to Greens 10 years ago. Like, it's more likely you're going to win in Mid-Suffolk than in Brighton. Um, but it's because in Brighton, both the Tories and Labour are strong and they have a good number of seats on the council, whereas in Mid-Suffolk, there's basically no Labour Party um, to speak of. I think there's also a plausible chance that the Greens could end up as the largest party in the Forest Dean uh, and, and, of course, on in, in Lancaster. Lewis as well, I think they, they did very well in the popular vote last time. At the moment, I believe they have this sort of uh, arrangement with the Lib Dems where they uh, alternate the leadership of the council every year. So uh, there was some confusion over that. I remember saying there's uh, the number of Green Council leaders is this number. And then people were like, no, 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 Lewis is around the leader. It's like, but it they were last year it's because they keep changing it the elections that are taking place in about four weeks time are in england there's also a set of elections that are taking place a couple of weeks afterwards in the north of ireland what can you tell us about those elections uh well there are elections for the the local councils um using the single transferable vote like all elections in northern ireland 
The political context is that the assembly remains shut down because the democratic unionists, the, the right wing, uh, far right unionists, um, are boycotting it. And the main thing to watch out for, I think, from an aggregate perspective, is who emerges as the largest force in local government. Because at the moment, it's um, uh, the DUP, I believe. Uh, and uh, they've been, you know, top of the pile in uh, assembly elections very frequently until the most recent one when Sinn Féin uh, won the most seats and the most votes. So if Sinn Féin manages to once again surpass the DUP, uh, as polls suggest that they will, that that will indicate the voters have not moved on from uh, their opinions since the last assembly election. But if the DUP managed to seize the, the crown of leading party again, they'll be very, very happy with that. I imagine they'll see that their boycott of the assembly has paid off electorally and uh, either, you know, it may, it may carry on, which will not be great for Northern Ireland. So I'm not saying I'm hoping for a Sinn Féin victory. I'm just saying that would be the, uh, you know, when we last had you on, we talked a little bit about the uh, the general election, the, the impending potentially by 2025 or maybe sooner general election. We talked about the Greens prospects in that. And thinking back now to the English local elections this year, if the Greens make these gains that we've been talking about, what do you think the potential impact of that is around the next general election? I think... If the Green Party continues to make big gains in local elections, and this really is a big test of them because they, you know, they made good ones in 2021, made good gains in 2022. Um, and if they make them again this time round, then that's building on an already incredibly impressive performance. And that really says that it was not at all a flash in the pan in any of those years. And that, I think, suggests that the Green Party is much stronger locally and organizationally than national polls would indicate, which I think definitely points to results that people would not expect in places like Bristol. Um, and, and maybe, you know, Waveney Valley, where um, Adrian Ramsey is, is, is standing as the, um, the candidate. Because uh, national polls can't pick up, you know, potentially big swings in Bristol Central, which is going to be the new Bristol West seat. Or, or indeed in Waveney Valley or in Brighton. And so I think that if the local elections go very well, then even if we haven't got any local election data in, in Bristol, because there aren't any this year, then it does point to the fact that Greens Party continues to be strong and continues to, even in the atmosphere of a massive swing to Labour, if they manage to make a ton of gains, then that points to a very, very strong party that's able to defy the national headwinds, which to me, that's a very good sign. Of course, this is all hypothetical. Results are not in yet. I don't want to call exactly. anything before it happens. But, um, yeah. I guess, though, that that, that that poses an interesting question for, I guess, the Labour Party strategy, because the Labour Party at the moment, you know, from, from everything that we're seeing from their communications and their messaging and their policies and so on, it basically seems like the approach they're taking is we need to win back uh, seats in the so-called red wall in the Midlands and North, where you know you have slightly more socially conservative voters, particularly pensioners um, and homeowners. And the reality is that the electoral coalition that the Labour Party um, has, the their, their, their kind of progressive, younger, urban voters have nowhere else to go. And so therefore they can tax the right on social issues like we've seen them doing on uh, trans rights, on um, on migration, on a whole bunch of so-called culture war issues. I guess what's your what's your reflection on 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 that in terms of the how that intersects with the Greens vote share in elections? Because if the Greens are doing well, presumably that means that actually those voters do have somewhere else to go and they very much will go somewhere else if Labour continues to take these reactionary lines on on social issues. They most certainly do. One of the interesting observations to make about the last Labour government, particularly when it started getting more and more right wing on social issues, whether it was ID cards, immigration, people forget the really, really terrible policies New Labour had on immigration or indeed on, on foreign policy like the Iraq war, was that a big beneficiary in places that had been strongly Labour were the Lib Dems. 
because they took the attitudes of we're against war, we're against ID cards, we're in favor of social liberalism, we want Labour to go further on like LGBTQ rights and things like that. And they would clean up in places like, you know, you know, they do really well in places like Liverpool, in the London boroughs. Uh, they were, you know, at one point they were running like um, London boroughs that had been Labour for a very long time. And of course, since 2015, that has gone the way of the dodo because the Lib Dems lost an enormous amount of credibility with those very same voters. And even if they recover, it's not going to be the same electoral coalition they used to have. Uh, but those people, I think, are receptive now instead to the Green Party. And you see this in local elections in London, for instance, where, you know, in places like Hackney or Newham, in Newham in particular is a very good case study where Labour voters are defecting to the Green Party in very large numbers, in Newham, in large enough numbers to give them the only seats on the council that are not Labour. Like the only the only non-Labour councillors in Newham are Greens because they're the only people who can compete against the Labour Party in that borough. Uh, and if you, you know, a decade ago or so, that would have been the Lib Dems, but they, they you know, they completely uh, uh, threw themselves into the bin. And now the Green Party, I think, have taken their place as the competitor party to Labour in metropolitan, liberal, young areas. And of course, Bristol is the epitome of that, as is Brighton. Uh, and I think Norwich is a bit of a sleeper hit for that as well. They did kind of poorly in the last few years, but they're on the upswing again. And it's interesting because obviously I'm based in Oxford and in Oxford in the um, New Labour era, it was, as you say, the Liberal Democrats that were the primary beneficiaries, also the Greens as well. The Greens in Oxford were, Oxford was one of the first places the Greens started winning substantial numbers of seats. But yeah, the Labour Party lost control of the council during the new Labour era in Oxford because the Lib Dems were mopping up votes across the city from those types of voters. Um, so very, very interesting indeed. And um, yeah, I think depressing as Labour's descent into kind of far right <laughs> positions is it nevertheless is interesting to see what the ramifications of that will be um on our politics um so i'm gonna let you enjoy the rest of your easter sunday now al uh before i do is there anything you wanted to plug things that you've got coming up with stats for lefties etc at all uh i just yeah encourage people to um to go to at lefty stats on twitter we Re uh, recently hit fifty thousand followers it's very exciting i did not think that would that would happen when i started the project uh, and yeah, I would just encourage people to um, subscribe to the Bright Green YouTube channel and uh, and visit Bright Green because it's a, um exceptional website that, uh, I, how long has it been going for at this point? Because it used to be Bright Green Scotland. It's been going for like so many years now. Yeah, 2010, so 13 years. Yeah, That's, long old time. It's so impressive. That's really impressive. Um, very valuable voice, not just in the Green Party, but on the left. So yeah, check it out.